Hey yeah, folks, Quilly Keen here, and welcome to another episode of our tutorial for Stellaris Console Edition for Complete Beginners. And in this episode, we're going to look at diplomacy <clears throat> and what happens when diplomacy goes less well, i.e. we're going to look at how to design warships. We've advanced the game a fair bit, about, I think, 20 years since the last episode, something like that. My territory has grown. Um, I've got three colonies now. And in addition to that, I've built some frontier outposts to ex extend our land here so that we bring more, more systems under our control, which we can then go and build mining bases and science bases and whatnot. I've got three science ships bopping around, and I've got a tiny little military task force, but we're going to be building that up in this episode. First, though, I want to talk about diplomacy. I have met two other empires, the Savix Cast Star Republic, who are big buttheads, and the Feral Star Concordate, who are my bros. Let's see why that is the case. If I go over to the left menu here and I go into the contact screen, this is a list of all known empires out there. And you can see, well, first there's myself right over here, player. Yep, okay, that's me for reference. And then there's the two other empires that I found. Let's take a look at the Savix Cost Star Empire or Star Republic over here, who I'm calling Buttheads. I am not friends with these guys. And the reason I'm not friends with these, well, let's find out. Over on the right hand side, you can see my relationship. This is their opinion of us, which is minus 165. We could actually see this on the previous screen right here. Once minus 165 plus 88. So positive numbers are good. Negative numbers mean they really, really dislike us. So the Savic cost really dislike us. Why is it? Well, first of all, if we go over here, we can see their opinion of us and why it's it is what it is. First of all, they are xenophobes. They're actually fanatic xenophobes. They hate all other aliens. They were never gonna like us. I met them right away, and right away they were like, you suck, and I was like, okay, I guess we're gonna be that way. Um, and like, all right, so we're never gonna be friends with these guys because they just hate all other aliens because they're xenophobes. So what I did right away is I declared them to be my rival. That was one of the options. Over on the left, these are all the diplomatic interactions you can do with the people that you're talking to over here. Some uh, options are grayed out depending on you know what your current status is. And I went ahead and I hit a button that was, um, I think, declare rivalry. I think that's what it's called. And that means I say, okay, you know what? You stink. I'm never going to like you. You're never going to like me. We're going to fight. Just deal with it. So they are my rivals. And I, I've said that I'm going to eliminate them. So that's worth another minus 100 to their opinion of us. So they're really, really, really not going to like us. Now, why would I declare a rivalry? Let me go and back out of the screen over here and go to the top menu and take a look at influence. So my influence here, I'm currently not making very much influence per month. And why is that? Well, mostly it's the frontier outpost. So I built some frontier outposts. That's what you can see, say, over here in Rurius, that little that little icon over there. As a frontier outpost, it's just a little star base that's out there. It doesn't do anything except expand my borders. So it sort of claims the space around it so that I can go and, you know, mine all these little um, solar systems and take advantage of them. Those cost influence to maintain. It's actually quite a lot of influence to maintain. So that cost me three. I also am spending some influence maintaining a defensive pack. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But you can see that from rivals, I am getting one influence per month from having a rival. So if you're not going to get along with someone, declaring rivalries is quite good because you will get more influence. In addition to that, having mutual rivals is quite great. So if we go and we take one last look at the Civex cost uh, Star Republic here, you can see I, I'm also allied to their rival, so they don't like me because of that. So we'll find out about that alliance in a second. But I can look, currently their fleet power is superior to ours, which isn't that surprising because I don't have very many ships. Their technology is about the same level, so that's good. Um, they have four colonies, they have 18 total population. We can look at their species, so they like, they like Arctic worlds. Um, and then we can take a look at their diplomatic status. That it's, their diplomatic status might be more than what's listed here if they're interacting with a species I don't know about. Um, so these, there's a bunch of deals here that have a red X. These are deals that the person I'm talking to is not willing to accept. Over on their right, you can see the acceptance. Like they don't want a migration treaty by minus 1,187. The acceptance has to be at least positive one for them to accept. These guys are really not interested. I mean, we're rivals, so they're not gonna say yes to anything. Um, we could still try to negotiate some sort of trade deal. We might be able to get something, but it's a little less likely because they hate us and we hate them. Um, uh, yes, I'm sure I wanna exit this trade. We could always try to declare war as well. This screen's a little bit weird. What we can do to go to war is we have to, we have to decide 
why we're going to war. You can't just go to war just for the sake of going to war. You have to have some sort of demand that you're making. So that's what happens if you go here. We're selecting our cells. We're making demands on behalf of our cells. And then we get to choose what our demands will be. We could demand that they give us planets. We could demand that they liberate planets. Liberating the planet just makes it independent. And, and here's the thing. If we're not supposed to be a super warlike race, then maybe what we'll do is we'll just liberate a bunch of independent planets instead of going and conquering. Um, these guys are, these guys are, they, they, they're really mean people. They support slavery and or purging of other species. We could force them to stop doing that. If we succeed in this war, they would stop supporting they would stop allowing slavery and perjury and we'd also get a whole bunch of influence we could also just humiliate them which reduces their influence gain and happiness and we gain the influence so there's a bunch of different options we could vassalize them vassalize means they bend the knee to us they're still their own empire except they have to listen to everything we say they can't start their own wars um and if we go to war they have to join on our side we could also make a tributary, which is sort of like Vassal, but they're more independent, but they pay us 25% of their monthly energy and minerals, which is pretty cool. It's worth noting that a vassalized nation does sort of count as being part of you for in terms of victory conditions and whatnot. In addition to that, someone who's been vassalized, you could, you can integrate them, annex them into your empire later on. It's actually a pretty cool and viable thing, and I definitely recommend you try it from time to time. You'll, you'll, you'll be surprised how effective and strong this is especially if you think you might have some hard time controlling these planets directly and that can happen with like xenophobes and stuff because they might not you know be willing to the, the, the citizens on these planets may not be willing to listen to you because you're a different alien we're not going to go to war now though what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and take a look at the feral star concordia these guys are my friends first of all look how pretty they are Oh, just gorgeous. So these guys are a lot friendlier and why is that we have a plus 88 relationship so first of all we are xenophiles, and assuming that the other people aren't xenophobes, people like xenophiles. I mean, I like them, right? I'm super eager, I'm an alien fanboy, and they appreciate that, so we have a boost to our relationship right away from that. We do have a penalty to our relationship. They are materialists, and I am a spiritualist. Those two things don't get along, so we actually have minus 20 to our relationship because of that. However, to counter that, we have mutual rivals. Both of us have rivaled the butthead empire that we don't like. So we, we like each other because we both agree that those other guys, they stink. And because we actually had a decent relationship, I was able to convince these guys, I asked these guys to join a defensive pact with me. A defensive pact is sort of a, it's a low tier lines. If either one of us is attacked, then the other person in defensive pact will jump in and defend that person. So if I start a war, these guys will not join me. But if someone starts a war against me, these guys will jump in on my side, which is very nice. So we have a relationship boost to that. In addition to that, we have something called trust. If we go over here, we can actually see what our trust is. Our trust is going up every month because we have two agreements going on. We have a defensive pact, which I just talked about. We also have a research agreement going on. Those two things increase our trust of each other every single month. And actually, because I'm a xenophile, the trust grows faster. And trust acts as a positive boost to our opinion. So we like each other quite a bit because of that. They have four colonies, 25 population, they're actually quite big. Like me, they're also, they like the Alpine territory. Um, and then we can see various diplomatic relationships that they've got going on. Because we're so friendly, we'll probably be able to get all kinds of other agreements going on. I'm, I'm going to look forward to getting a migration tree with these guys at some point. Right now, it's not quite enough. They're at minus 12. We need this to be at least plus one for them to agree. But as our, our trust grows, our opinion will grow, which means at some point they'll be willing to go for a migration treaty. Um, we can take a look at how trading works over here. So this is the trade screen, and I offer something on the left and ask for something on the right. And we can do a huge combination of things over here. We already have a research agreement, but let's look at what that does. For every technology that the other person has, so if I am in a research agreement with these guys, for every technology they have that I don't, I research that technology 25% cheaper. So I research them faster and vice versa. So it's very win-win. Now we already have a research agreement, but I think it's only for 10 years. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna propose, hey, we're such great friends. Let's go and agree to a full, uh, full length, which is 30 years research agreement, okay? Where we share technology with each other. That looks pretty good. They're not willing to agree quite yet. Why is it their trade acceptance is zero? It needs to be at least a one. They want me to sweeten the deal a little bit. 
Okay, fair enough. Tell you what, I have lots of minerals. I'm gonna go to my minerals here. I could offer them minerals per month, but I'm just gonna do an instant transfer. I'm just gonna say, listen, I'm gonna send a few rocks your way. Can we make this work? And I'm just gonna hold down the right stick a little bit. Oh, there you go. It actually happened very quickly. Oh, right there. If I give them 20 minerals just one time, they will now agree to a 30 year research agreement. Sounds great. Let's go ahead and confirm that. We could also trade information about stars and different things. That actually wouldn't be a terrible idea. We're gonna have to wait for them to agree or disagree to this deal first, but I know they're gonna agree. Okay, so that's lovely, but let's figure out the military situation. These guys are my rivals and they have a more powerful fleet than I do. That seems dangerous. We should probably build one up. This, that being said, we don't actually border each other. There's no way for these guys to get to me unless they take a long walk around here or they go through my buddies over here because um, we don't actually connect to each other. Right over here is actually like, it's a blank spot, there's no connection. So they're not really a threat. But what's much more annoying, you see all these red exclamation marks? These are systems that have hostile vessels in them. These, I, I, I happen to know each one of these systems here has ancient mining drones. Uh, maybe not over here actually, uh, I'm not sure. But at least down here, I know for sure, these are systems with ancient mining drones. They've been around, we don't know how long, and they've just turned hostile. They attack any ship that comes through here, which means I can't survey this system. If there was a planet here, I can't go and colonize it because it's just being guarded by these dumb robots. So we would like to blow them up. We know when last time we visited here, they had a strength of 602. Our current fleet over here on the right, first task force, only has a strength of 145. That's not gonna cut it. Two ways we can increase our military strength. One, build more ships which sure, yeah, totally. And two, we can make our current ships better. And I've actually gone ahead and unlocked quite a bit of new technology um, since the last video. So I'm gonna take the opportunity to go and redesign a bunch of my ships. I'm gonna go into the menu on the left here. I'm gonna go to ship designer. So on this screen is all of our ships that we can currently build and design. Uh, including defense platforms, which you can build around star bases. Transport flip the ships carry mil um, like troops, like armies to invade other planets, our science ships, we know what those do, the colony ship, the construction ship, and then we have the Corvette over here. Oh my, hold on, am I on the wrong save? Uh-oh. I thought I had destroyers unlocked. Oh, two months, hold on, let's go ahead and unpause that um, and let time go and we'll unlock the destroyer. Apparently I did not make a save after unlocking the destroyer. Trade deal came through, they've agreed, excellent, wonderful, you guys are the best. And we're just waiting for the destroyer tech to come in here. I got my ships moving around. Everything's good. My economy's not the best in terms of energy, just barely turning a profit, but I got tons of minerals. I've been trying to save up as much as possible. I guess we can take a moment and talk about the planets over here. Um, do I have an example? Yes, okay. So these tiles over here, you see this little uh, yellow arrow facing up? This means I can upgrade the building on this tile. This is currently a basic mine. If I click on this tile and choose upgrade, I can replace this mine with a mining network one. So a basic mine has a one mineral bonus, mining network one has a two mineral bonus. So I'd absolutely like to go ahead and upgrade you to that. And in fact, over here, the hydroponic farms, I can go from a basic to a hydroponic farm one to increase our food output, that's great. We can remove some of these tile blockers as well. So we've got some mountain ranges here that we can clear out of the way so that we can eventually build um, improvements here, build buildings. Notice that some of these tiles have a red outline. These are tiles with blockers that we don't currently have the technology to deal with. We're gonna need technology to go and remove these blockers. And this is usually done, or I think maybe exclusively done in the society research category. Anyway, if we look down uh, over here in the alerts, I have just researched the technology, oh, for deflectors. But I think we also have the destroyer technology too. Um, ooh, basic combat computers is very handy. Physics lab, improved deflector. We'll get the basic combat or the specialized combat computers. And yeah, we did finish our engineering research at the same time. So we have destroyer access and I will research. Let's, let's make Urantic crystal mining visible. Um, if we find any, so by doing this, it'll reveal this resource. And if we have access to this resource, we're gonna have 15% bonus damage with energy weapons, which is what we use. Energy weapons are lasers. So that's great. Okay. So now let's go back to the left-hand side. We're gonna go to ship designer and there we go. So we have our Corvettes. So this is what we're using. We've got this Valergian, 
yeah, Valerian, I guess, class Corvettes um, that we have already. And we have uh, now the ability to build destroyers, which are currently called Avamdor destroyers. You can, if you don't want to deal with ship design at all, come up here and just hit this check mark for auto generate designs, and the uh, the computer will try to do its best to design ships for you. But we're going to go ahead and manually do this. First, we're going to take a look at our Corvettes. So right now, our Corvettes, this is what we're looking at. They've got a certain cost. Uh, this auto upgrade tag is fine to mostly leave on. Um, it will auto upgrade components mostly when new things are unlocked. Although this is an example where it didn't actually kick in. So I don't know. Anyway, so the cost to build this thing, the build time, the maintenance cost, so on and so various stats. But the real thing that you're mostly looking at is over here, these various components. So there are the core components, which are up here, and there will always be one drive, one uh, sort of like AI behavior or, or, you know, computer systems for the ship, one thruster and one uh, sensor system. Now, if we were to unlock technology, so by clicking on the sensor system, I can see all of the um, types of sensors we've unlocked. We only have the basic level. Same thing for the thrusters, same thing for the, um, the computers and same thing for the hyperdrive. You can actually build your ship with no FDL at all, no faster than light travel. They will not be able to leave the current system they're in. So it's not very handy, but I mean, it's sort of there. It's mostly there for like the stuff that doesn't move. In addition to that, you can change the section, the basic sort of hull design of your ship. For these Corvettes, we only have one hull design available currently. The Interceptor, which has three small weapon slots, three small utility slots, two medium utility slots, and one auxiliary slot. That's what this means. As you unlock technology, you might get different types of sections available. In particular, I think if we unlock point defense weapons, which are really meant to shoot down incoming missiles, then we would get a different option here for our hull. But this hull type is fine. By quote unquote changing the hull type, it does clear what was here before, which is fine because we're going to want to redesign everything. So this hull type has three slots for weapons. They're small weapon slots over here. If we click on a slot, we can see everything we've got unlocked, okay? Um, actually, if we hit X, it'll show obsolete. We had red lasers. We have now unlocked blue lasers. By default, it hides obsolete components. So blue lasers are just level two lasers. They're just straight out better than red lasers. We can see why. Red lasers have an average damage of 1.8 per second and blue lasers are 2.03. If you look at the damage, blue lasers just do slightly more damage. You can see like, if I go back and forth, you can see what numbers are changing. Blue lasers use more power and they cost more minerals, but they do more damage, seems okay. So I'm gonna select blue lasers for all three of these slots over here. Um, well, I say that, we're actually at negative 25 power now. We actually don't have enough power out of the box to run these blue lasers. Okay, we might be able to do something about that. Right, I forgot. I'm getting confused with uh, another version of Stellaris. Right, so we need 25 power to run these lasers. Down in these utility slots over here, we can do various things. Small and, and medium and large slots are basically the same. You can, in a small slot, I could put a fission reactor, which gives us power. So a small fission reactor gives us 10 power for five minerals. If we look in the medium, the medium fission reactor gives us twice as much power for twice as much cost. And I think the large slot is four times as much. And that's basically all it is. So we're going to need some power here. Let's go ahead and get a medium slot filled with a fission reactor. So now we're at negative five power. And let's put a fission reactor in a small slot. So we're at plus five. You need to have non-negative power for to make a legal design. So we need to have at least positive power here. Okay. Um, so we still have some slots left. Let's see, can we get some shields on here? Cause that would be nice. We've got deflecto shields. So this is a medium slot. So it's gonna need uh, five power and it's gonna give us shield hit points and shields auto regenerate. They, they you know, if they, the shields take damage, they come back up and fill themselves up, you know, over time. Um, so yeah, sure. We'll put a medium slot in there. That took exactly five power. So we're at exactly zero power, which is fine. As long as we're not negative power, we're okay. We got two more slots over here. I suppose we could add another deflector shield, but then we'd be at negative power. So we'd have to add another fission reactor. And I mean, the shields only take 2.5 power. The fission reactor gives us 10. That seems like an awkward number. Let's just put a couple of pieces of armor. I have the level two armor unlocked, the Serrano metal armor here, level two. It gives us 2.5 armor and it doesn't use any power. So shields tend to give you more hit points than armor does. However, um, 
shields need power. Shields do auto auto regenerate, which is nice. But you you know you have to do a mix. So you have to try to figure out how do I get the most bang for my buck where my buck is basically power. Like sure, you know, the fancier the component, then the more the mineral cost of building this will be. But overall, what you really want to do is just try to like put as much stuff as possible without running out of power. This A slot, this auxiliary slot, we don't have anything unlocked that can fit in there. So we can't do anything about it. So we'll just have to leave it empty. What we can do at this point is we can rename this ship. So uh, let's call this ship, um, I don't know, let's call it the Lil. It's the little guy, the little guy right there. Boom. Excellent. So we're going to accept this name and we're going to go and save this design. Now, if I back out of here, we'll now have two Corvette designs. We have the old Villargian and then we have the new Lil guy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the old Velargian design just to not confuse things. This is only deleting the design. It doesn't change any of our ships that we already have. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And we'll not be able to design ships of that design anymore, but that's okay. So we got the little guy and then we're going to have the destroyer model over here. So if we look at the destroyer, destroyer can fit a lot more stuff. It has two segments over here. And again, if we look, ah, so this, okay. So it has a front part, the bow and the back part, the stern. And if we look at the bow part, we actually have two options available. We have the gunship bow, which has two small weapons and one medium weapon, and the artillery, which is a single large weapon. Now, a single large weapon does more damage than you know a single small or medium weapon. But effectively, these two are basically gonna be the same. Um, because I think a large weapon is by default designed to be about four times as much damage as a small. All right, small, medium is times two, and a large is times four, sort of kinda. So they're sort of equivalent. The big difference is large weapons tend to have much longer range, which is kind of nice. They can shoot things from a lot further away, but large weapons aren't very good at shooting tiny little things. So early in the game, we're gonna be fighting other tiny little ships. Corvettes and destroyers are pretty small. So we're actually gonna be much better off shooting small weapons, generally speaking. And how can you tell? Well, if you we pick one of these weapons, like the blue laser, see over on the right, it's, the blue laser has a 90% accuracy and a 60% tracking. This is the small, the small blue laser is 90 and 60. If we look at the medium version, it's 85 and 30. It's slightly less accurate and worse at tracking. Tracking is particularly important for, for tracking things that are fast and very evasive. We can see over here on the, on the left-hand side, our ship has a certain evasion number. Smaller ships and faster ships are better at evading. They just dodge bullets completely. So, um, for small ships to counter evasion, you really need good accuracy, but also good tracking. Big ships basically have no evasion, so you don't care about tracking at all. And in fact, at that point, you mostly just wanna maybe outrange them. So then you go to big weapons so you can fire from very far away. But ship design, this is a big part of ship design. The other thing you'll see when we have these lasers selected, see where it says ignores 30% of armor, but, and minus 20 shield damage. Lasers are bad against shields. Lasers do less damage against shield but are really good against armor because they actually just ignore armor to a certain extent. Armor reduces the amount of uh, incoming damage that comes in and lasers ignore part of that. So one of the parts of the game is trying to figure out, are my opponents really shield heavy, really armor heavy? What's their deal? Lasers suck against shield, good against armor. Projectile weapons are good against armor, are good against shields, but less good against armor. And finally there's missiles, which are pretty good against everything and have good long range, but missiles can be shot down by point defense weapon. So there's like weird sort of rock, paper, scissory kind of combination going on with weapon design. Usually you're just gonna to wanna to put in your best weapons, your highest tech weapon, the one with the highest average damage. But as you unlock more stuff, you might start to get a little fancier with your designs. In any case, we're gonna go ahead and load up our ship here with blue lasers. Um, our back, the back of our ship, we either have the interceptor or the gunship. The interceptor is two small slots. Again, I'm gonna keep going with the logic that um, smaller weapons are gonna be better early on for shooting down tiny ships. So we're gonna go with this. And these are gonna be particularly good at taking out these mining drones that I'm talking about because mining drones, I think have no armor. They're just pure shield. So this is gonna be great because, or sorry, they have no shield, they're pure armor. So the lasers are gonna be really good against mining drones because we, we don't have to worry about shields. Their weapons, mining drones weapons tend to be really bad against shield as well. They basically use laser weapons. So if we're gonna fight laser drones, mining drones rather, we're gonna want as many shields as possible. 
Let's go ahead. Let's load on. I don't know. Let's uh, throw in three medium deflectors. And see if we can balance out the power. Oh, no. We're not going to be able to. Let me remove one of these deflectors. Put a fission reactor. Another fission reactor. Okay, we're at zero power. And I'll put in a little bit of armor. We're pretty weakly armored, but I think that's going to be really good against the drones. And again, we still have no auxiliary systems. I really like... I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this design. I'm going to go and rename it to the... Um, I don't know. What are we going to be? Um, the... This is sort of a bug squasher. Oops. Um, bug... Squasher. It's really good at killing tiny ships. Later on... So, there's going to be a bunch of different ship classes. Uh, there's the, After the destroyer, there's a cruiser. After the cruiser, there's a battleship. Um, in terms of, you know, what is better, bigger tends to be better. But there's all kinds of caveats to that. Little corvettes that are designed with big engines, and if you start unlocking afterburners, which are auxiliary components, your um, little corvettes can... Oop, hold on, I didn't actually save this ship, did I? Oh, no! Ah! Uh... Damn it. If I go autocomplete ship... Yeah, no. Um... You can use that autocomplete button to fill things out, which is really nice. They'll try to balance out power. Uh, let me do this. And... Um, I think we had more power. We had a second medium deflector. Oh. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Um, what did I call this guy? The bug squasher. <gasps> Darn it. Bug. Squasher. Anyway, I was, I was saying that, like, there's definite use for different things. Um, small ships are very hard to hit. So, if someone's just coming at you with big ships with big weapons, build a bunch of small ships. So that they'll they'll try to avoid that. Um, accept, save. There we go. And now I'm going to go and delete the old design. Um, and so there's there is going to be a lot of that game. You might want to design your corvettes and destroyers to be good. If you're if someone's coming out with a bunch of uh, missiles, then especially destroyers can be built to be really good point defense weapons. So all they do, their goal is to just shoot down enemy missiles as they come in and protect your battleships and cruisers, for example. So there's a lot of different ideas for how you might construct things. As you get um, better sensors and better engines, you're probably going to want to go and upgrade your design for your science ships and colony ships and construction ships and things like that. Okay, so now we have a new design made, but that doesn't actually change our current ships. Our task force over here is still made up of our old Valergians over here. So it's the old name, and if we were to go and look at their stats over here, we'd know... Oh, we can actually look at the, the stuff. These are the, the, the ships with the old single red lasers. Very not good. We want to upgrade these ships. If we go to the Manage tab, there's actually a button here for Upgrade Fleet. If you do this, they will automatically move to the closest sp spaceport, and then you have to spend minerals, but they will be upgraded to the latest ship design. So if I do this, boop, these guys, there we go, upgrading ships. And if I uh, unpause... You'll see it progress forward. This happened very quickly. Small, cheap ships tend to upgrade very quick. Big ships tend to take a lot longer. But there we go. So now, if I pause again, this fleet is now made up of our little guy designs. Five little guys. Wonderful. And the fleet strength has gone up. They were, what, 150, 155? So now these strength ships are 167, which is a fair bit better. Um, but still not everything we need. Let's go and build some more ships. So I'm going to go into my planet here. Alpine Prime, which has a spaceport. And I... Oh! I cannot build destroyers. What? I need a level 3 spaceport to build destroyers. Okay. So let's upgrade this spaceport to a level 2. And in fact, a level 3. So we'll queue it up all the way up to a level 3. We'll do that. Um, we'll also... I'm going to queue up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Corvettes. We'll get a few more Corvettes that's going to be fine. And then I'll build a bunch of destroyers. So we'll unpause. That's going to be okay. My other planets, I actually have built spaceports here as well. So I think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to upgrade all these guys to the level 3 um, spaceports. Which will give me most options. Ooh, System I can set. upgrade you to, uh, to the new centralized building so from the reassembled ship shelter to the planetary administration building yes please and i guess i'm gonna go ahead and queue up clearing out these mountain range tile blockers that seems okay um and then the spaceport right 
you're gonna go spaceport upgrade and I don't have enough minerals right now to go all the way up to the max, but that's going to be fine. So we'll just have to wait for that to finish. Meanwhile, my ships are still exploring around. Excellent. Looking good. Yeah, it'll be really nice if we can clear this out. So we're going to take a look at the combat. Probably attack this one first. It's only 403. So that'll be a little easier to do than the 600. Although we'll probably still lose some ships. In particular, we'll probably lose a bunch of Corvettes. Early on, it probably makes sense. If you've unlocked destroyers, just build destroyers. Later on, there is more purpose to these, these mixed things, but early on, usually you just like build the biggest thing that you can and call that good enough. And actually with that in mind, I will actually go over here and I'm gonna go and cancel these Corvettes. I will build one. So your fleet size over here, we looked. I'm currently at five of 22 because I have five ships. It's not just that I have five ships. The amount of naval capacity used by ships is based on their size. Corvettes use one naval capacity, destroyers use two, cruisers use three, and battleships use four. Also, your naval capacity grows as you build spaceports, as your population grows as well. So we're actually up to 26 here because by leveling up my spaceports, my, I've got more capacity for the, uh, the ships. So I'm building one Corvette because it'll bring us to an even number of six. And then what I could do, I could build uh, 10 destroyers, for example, and uh, that will bring us up to 26. You can go over your naval capacity, but then you have to spend a ton of money in maintenance, so it's usually not what you want to do. I'm just watching Adnor here in the outliner. You can see that little uh, progress bar. That's an upgrading of our starbase. So I'm just going to wait for that to finish, and then I'll be able to start building the destroyer. I've got an idle science ship. Where are you? Boop. Up over here. What do we got? Oh, we actually have something to research here. Research projects and system. Let's do that and see what we can do. <laughs> and these guys are still fine. We're losing a little bit of food, but I think that's going to be okay uh, because we are continuing to build and upgrade a few things. We'll probably build some more farms soon. Going to be all right. Ooh, you can upgrade Oops, over System here to the mining network too. Sounds great to me. Notice if you change your mind, you can also replace a building, right? So let's say, um, I don't know, I decide I really don't want this farm anymore. Like, yeah, there's food in this tile, but I don't care that much. I can go to replace and replace it with a different type of building, should I want. I'm not going to do that now, because I actually do really need the food. Oh, we've finished another research project. Ah, yes, I'm not going to read this. These these events, like, really... <laughs> oh, man, so many of them are so funny and so awesome. I kind of don't want to spoil things for you guys too, too much. So we're going to leave it there. This science ship has nothing to do. He's sort of boxed in. He can't... Re he can't survey any of these things until stuff gets uh, cleared out by our fleet. There's really not... I guess you could come way over here. I guess I'm just going to leave you here for now. Or you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move the science ship way down here. We're going to move you to Caster. Because once we clear out these things, we'll want to survey this area. Plus, when you get in a fight, debris tends to left, be left behind. Your science ships can go and scan that debris and maybe get some free technology. Okay, Adnor's spaceport is done upgrading. So now I can build destroyers. Uh, I'm gonna queue up as many as I can. So that's five right now. And then we'll have to get some more minerals, but that might be enough to go and take this. I don't know. You do wanna go in with overwhelming force as much as possible. Um, so that, because if you go in with just barely enough, you'll probably lose a bunch of stuff. If you go in with overwhelming force, you probably won't lose much, if anything, and that's great. Ooh, we need some new society research. Okay, we haven't talked about the sectors System yet, survey which I still have to do. Uh, oh, okay. Um, let me research this. Let's pause a second here. We have discovered... Oh, what system was that in? Was that here? Yes. Okay, in the Volana system, right over here, you see this axe system, this axe icon? We've discovered some primitives in this system. There is a planet here where some people already live. They're not part of a space empire. There's a bunch of people that live here that are not spacefaring. Um, if we go to the planet screen, we can see this is a Renaissance age primitive civilization. Eventually, left untouched, they will eventually progress into the modern age and so on and so forth, and will eventually become their own spacefaring empire. We can do a few things with this. If this were within our borders, one of the things we could do is um, let me actually unpause, is we could build an observation post in orbit of this planet, and that would give us a bunch of society research. We just watch these guys, 
and learn stuff about, you know, society and culture and things from doing that. We could do it passively, where we just sit back and watch, you know, very Star Trek Prime Directive. Or we could be a little bit more active, where we occasionally abduct people and maybe probe them. We could also do other things, like we could actively go and try to enlighten their society and bring them into the modern age, and then they would join our empire um, as a vassal. The other thing we could do is actually try to disguise ourselves as member of their species, infiltrate all forms of their government, take over their planet, and have them just join our empire that way. It's a little rude, but also very effective. To do any of that, they'd have to be within our borders, though, so we're not going to be able to work with that, unfortunately. Oh, what else did I want to talk about before um, we start wrapping this up here? Oh, one of my scientists died. Oh, no. Well, that's okay. Um, we'll just have to replace it. Uh, so I think it, okay, it's one of our researcher scientists. So how do I know that? Let me pause here. All of our science ships are still doing things. They, they can't survey if they don't have a science scientist. But the other thing is the, the warning at the bottom here. Engineering has no scientist present. So engineering is now going to have negative research rates, basically, because there's no scientist assigned. So we're going to go and assign a scientist. And here's the thing. I'm really tempted to grab this guy. This guy is currently commanding one of our science ships, but he's got the spark of genius. That light bulb, that gives him 10% boost to all research, which is pretty good. But let's see who we might be able to recruit. Ooh. Okay, actually, this works for me. Because I don't tend to go for any of the... Um, uh, the traits that is just research in one particular category. It's not even like all engineering research or whatever. It's a type of engineering research. Meh. Meticulous, though, gives us an increased chance to discover anomalies. That doesn't not, That's not good for someone doing research, but it's great for someone running a survey ship. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hire this guy, but I'm not going to assign Modrig to the engineering research. Instead, I'm going to grab Valdrig here, which has got the spark of genius, so he's got a 10% boost. Scientists also get better at research as they level up. So this is a level five guy with the spark of genius. I'm putting him in charge of my engineering de department. So he's got a 40% speed boost to research. He's got the skill spark of genius. Um, I've also uh, researched an administrative AI assistant. And uh, we have an event going on right now from something that happened earlier, and I don't want to tell you what it is to spoil it. That's given me an extra 15% boost to research for a little while. So now we're researching really fast. But now one of our science ships over here doesn't have a leader. This one over here. So I'm going to go with a manage. I'm going to recruit a leader. And I'm just going to grab Modrig over here, who's just sitting idle. He's going to come in. So he's slightly better at discovering anomalies, which is awesome. Okay, we'll unpause some more. Still bring up our task force, which is great. We do have an idle science ship. Oh, that's the one that I've sent the Castor, so he's just gonna sit there for now until we clear things out. Adnor is still building some ships. I would like you to keep going as much as possible here with the destroyers. Um, actually, what I might wanna do is go to, oops, I'm misclicking all over the place. Okay, cancel, go here. Go to one of my other sp space ports. I'm gonna queue up two destroyers here. And at Quill Rocks, <laughs> I'm going to uh, not have enough money. Oh, no, you need a level three spaceport. Um, you know what? Build me a couple of Corvettes. It's gonna be fine. Now, we have a rally point set by default on our capital planet. Oh, oh, another observation post. We found another um, primitive race, cool. So in Adnor, set as our um, rally point here. You can set any planet um, as a rally point. I think you can set a fleet as a rally point as well. Evading hostile fleet. Oh man, we came across a pirate hub. Okay, we'll try to kill that. Yeah, there we go. There. So now the fleet here is set as a rally point. So new ships, by default, I believe ships will go to a fleet rally before a planet rally. Um, I suppose to make sure I could get rid of it, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. So new ships will automatically join our existing task force. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, we've got... Oh yeah, hold on. We've got a bunch of idle science ships. I'm not convinced that they really have much left to do. You're in Caster. Sure. You're in Nedim. Yeah, you're kind of done. Oh, no, you can still... This, this is a friendly territory, so we can go and survey through our friend's territory. Because we have open borders with them. So we may as well do that. See what they've got going on. Just queuing up a bunch of that. Excellent. Uh, maybe I'll do the same thing with this science ship, which is way over here. Why'd you stop moving? I'm betting you fell through a wormhole and you just got teleported over here. Construction Let's complete. queue up a few of these. That's going to be fine. Okay. 
Um, so you can see these ships over here are all moving. I, oh, you see this? They're disappearing after a bit because when they reach Adnir and they reach the fleet, they're automatically going to merge with their first task force, which is just parked there. And our first task force is definitely going to be strong enough to go and bop some dudes. So we're going to go and bop some dudes in this video. There you go. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. So let's see. First of all, I'm going to make sure you are on aggressive stance. You will automatically go and engage anyone you meet. And I'm going to send you to this system. Why aren't you going? Hold on. Oh! Because I, I changed you to evasive stance. My bad. <laughs> P, uh, fleets on an evasive stance will not go into hostile territory. But there we go. This fleet, which is now actually on aggressive stance, we're gonna, is going to move into here. They'll automatically engage anything they find. That fifth task force is still trying to catch up to the first task force. We'll probably merge or at least follow them all the way here, which is going to be okay. Oh, my. We have no research going on right now. Um, so we could get the next level spaceport, which... A, I mean, is bigger and badder and has more module space. Also has the ability to build, um, ooh, thank you, um, destroyer assembly yards, which let us build destroyers cheaper and faster, but also will lead us to the cruiser type ship, the next biggest ship. That being said, I think I like the idea of grabbing ion thrusters. It's a really cheap tech. Look, 367. We've sort of been ignoring this and researching that would make our ships a lot faster. So they'll move through space faster, but it also will make them more effective in combat because they'll be slightly dodgier. Um, ooh, Vitality Boosters increases our leader lifespan. This is quite nice because the last thing you want is your elderly but five-star skill leaders to die. You want them to stay around as long as possible so you get to take advantage of it. It also leads down the biological path, ooh, let's pause, for more genetic evolution too. That being said, I think what I'll do is I'll get the, um, the uh, a tile blocker removal tech so that we can get all the tiles on our planet going and if we select research at the top for engine or for physics you'll see i've got a fourth pick here that's because i actually had a science ship research some debris from a battle against pirates at some point so we have a partially researched active countermeasures here we had 62 of 652 research um so i could finish that ai controlled colony ships so slightly better colony ships Fusion reactor, this unlocks, so remember how we were trying to balance the power in our ship? This gives us a better uh, power core for our ship, so we'll be able to power more powerful weapons and more powerful shields without as many power cores, which is really valuable. Um, assist research, this is the technology which makes it so, if your science ships are just sitting around, they're not doing anything, you can have them assist research on a planet. You just send them to one of your planets, and what they do is they give your planet a 10% boost to all their research, which is all really good. What I think I'll do is I'll research the active countermeasures, though, so we'll have point defense available if we start to run into people who use a lot of missiles. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the combat going on over here in the system. So our fleet has just arrived in the system here. We've got our eight corvettes and six destroyers versus 14 corvette class ships over here on behalf of the mining drones what i'm going to do is i'm going to unpause and i'm going to hold y just to slow the speed down so we're going sort of slow motion over here you get to see this nice dramatic battle ah oh, so many lasers going on if i click on here i can actually take a different look at the battle so we can see each side we can sort of scrooch through each ship and see how they're doing um, and we can also figure out maybe what kind of stuff is going on and get a variety of stats. But I'm going to stay in pretty, pretty battle mode here. We haven't lost any ships yet, and they are starting to lose some over here. That's great. Oh, we did just lose a Corvette. It's possible the Corvette wasn't destroyed. Your ships will try to retreat if they take too much damage. So that Corvette may have just retreated out of battle. Um, actually, that might be the one that's sitting way back here. That's probably still getting shot, but isn't actively engaging. That actually might be what happens. They're not actually gone. They're just trying to avoid direct combat and trying to stay out of range. So we're clearly going to do okay here. I'm just going to go ahead and bring us up to full speed once more. And there we go. We've cleared out all the enemies from this system. So I'm going to zoom out over here. This system has now been cleaned, which is grand. If we go and select our fleet over here, our fleet has taken a bit of damage. I could go and tell to repair. It would move it to the closest spaceport and try to repair up. Honestly, I think we're probably mostly okay. What I'm going to do instead of doing that, uh, I'm going to pop out of here. With my task force selected, I'm going to send them to this system. This system has a defense fleet of about 600. We should still outnumber them a fair bit. And remember, while 700 versus 600 doesn't seem like that big of a strength difference, 
our ships are ideal for fighting against these drones because the drones are using weapons that are bad against shields. So, and we have shields. We're using weapons also that are bad against shields, but good against armor. And the drones don't have shields. They just mostly have armor. So we're doing a lot better than the 700 versus the 600 would make you think. Anyway, now I'm going to grab the science ship that's just chilling in caster. I'm going to sell it, send it to the system. I do want it to survey, but first I want it to research. That yellow exclamation mark, there's a project to research here. And what it is, it's debris in the system. And actually, if I go and look at the situation log, you can see we have debris in the system and there's a timer. You only have so long to go and try to um, ooh, and try to, um, root, uh, to collect the uh, the debris. And you can see there's traces of various components for lasers and armor and stuff like that. So we're sending a ship over there to do that. Excellent. And actually, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to send a construction ship over here. We might go and build another frontier outpost in this area, depending on if the territory is good. And usually systems that are guarded by um, mining drones tend to be very good mining systems, which kind of makes sense, I suppose, right? So there's a really good chance we got that. We can also take a look at the at the final combat results over here and see how we did. You get a breakdown of what weapon did more damage, how much were we able to dodge, you know and how accurate all our shots were. There's a lot of information you can get from that that you can use to maybe make things better, or, you know, who cares? Just send people in and pew pew, and that's fine too. Another battle going on. I gotta say, one thing that's really nice about playing this on console is it's really easy with the analog sticks to get some pretty views of the combat going on. Oh my god, so many bright lights. So we have lost some stuff here. Two Corvettes. Oh, a destroyer. Again, some of these may have just uh, retreated rather than been destroyed find out afterwards. We knew this was going to be a little tougher because it's a slightly stronger force, but overall not too shabby. So another system to ours. Take the task force over here. What I'm definitely going to do now is tell these guys to go and repair at the closest place. So we have five destroyers left and four corvettes. And there's some more bits that we can go and collect, so we can send a science ship over here. Ooh, this is a special mission to go and collect a bunch of alien species all over the place. I will say yes to that, but we're not really going to showcase that in this video, unfortunately, because we're basically out of time. But there we go. We've got, I mean, this is kind of everything you need to run your little empire. Um, you know, we've colonized some systems. You know how to send a colony ship. Expanding your borders with the construction ship is very nice. Um, we can't do it right now. We could, I guess if I sent it to Castor, I could build a frontier outpost here. And that would be a way to expand my borders without colonizing. I'd rather not put it in Castor. I'd like to put it a little further away. It does cost you more influence the further away you do it. But if I do it here, it wouldn't gain us very much territory. Where if I build it in Impultov, it should give us quite a bit more space. Um, this science ship over here, I'm going to queue up and tell you I want you to survey this and then survey that, please. And we'll see what we've got going System on for us. Survey. That's going to be swell. Military force is rebuilding. I'll probably, uh, what I would do here is I would continue to build up my military force as much as possible and um, uh, clear out the rest of these little mining drones, see what we can do. And eventually, maybe bring some pain over here. But honestly, once these mining drones are cleared, I can go, see, I can finally go and explore this space over here. I don't know what's here. There's probably another neighbor. Are they going to be friendly or not? I have no idea. Only time will tell. Anyway, with that, oh, I have another, uh, I have another tradition available. So yeah, I will go and grab. Uh, if you're, oh yes, faith in science. If we're assisting research on a planet, it increases that planet's happiness by ten percent with this upgrade. I really like that. Oh right, I forgot planetary survey cores over here. Every time we survey a system, we get research points for free. I should have gotten that a little bit sooner, but that's okay. Uh, and I have to get some more technology. Let's just see. Granthium would reveal another resource. This gives you more ship hull point if you have access to it. That's pretty good. Let's do that. Um, and over here. Ah, colonization centralization gives us a new upgrade to the planetary capital. Um, if our planet has a population of 10 or higher, we can go ahead and build this, which is much, much, much better than the base version. Um, we can also get this for cheaper war demands, but colonization centralization will be good. Currently losing a little bit of cash, but I'm pretty confident that's going to bounce back as we continue to look to expand. Not to mention, there may be some more energy buildings that I can build on some of these planets over here, and that's what I'll focus on. Folks, that is it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to see you guys next time.